we have a question and answer if anybody has a question. And it's just basically any Bible questions, uh, maybe uh, this morning's uh, message that uh, uh, I understand last Sunday only nine minutes of it made it online, but that's all right. I can say all that again uh, tonight. So any questions before? Uh, yes. Oh, no, you don't have. No, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> just walk down the aisle and you have a question. Oh, there we go. Here we're started. What a blessing. Let me get over here and write them down. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, when was BC and AD, esta AD established? When do we begin to measure time? <clears throat> Excuse me. When did the people in the Old Testament before Christ actually count down the years? Okay, BC, AD, and the last part, when do Old Testament what? Um, when did they actually count down? Were they actually counting down um, before Christ came? was time established after that? Ah, the, the time measurement uh, uh, in the Old Testament, that's good. And hello, my name is what? Kathy Trombley. Okay. Oh, hi, Kathy. Hi, Jim's wife. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, good. Uh, B.C. and A.D., and then how did they measure time? And that is a good question, especially all of us that are going to be reading through the uh, um, scriptures this year because it's very interesting. It shows up as you're reading. Yes, ma'am. Is that Liz? Yeah, it is. Okay. This is Liz Morris. Um, some of the new contemporary songs and say, sing a new song unto the Lord. And some of the Psalms say that too. What does it mean to sing a new song unto the Lord? Oh, what does it mean? Sing a new song. Other than you mean Psalm 40, which says that. Okay, what does it mean to sing a new song? That is a good question. Uh, basically, uh, of course, in Revelation, it's um, when they sing a new song in Psalm 40, just so I remember what you're talking about there. Okay, anybody else? Oh, boy, this, we might have a short night. Oh, all right, Dale. In um, Hebrews 11, 12, it says, um, and so from one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. I think you've indicated that there have probably been about 40 billion people that have been on the earth up till now. But the number of stars by themselves would be a number that would be astronomical in comparison to that. So is that literal, literal or just figurative? That is a good question, Dale. By the way, um, you can only see about 8,000 stars with the unaided human eye, but the total number of stars, the only thing that they, we can compare it to is there are many, as many stars in the universe so far that they've been able to measure as we have synaptic connections in our minds, which is uh, several quadrillion. So that's a, but that's a good question. Uh, how do we reconcile number of stars and sands of the sea um, with uh, Hebrews 11, 12. Hello, my name is Barney Martlew. I recognize you. Um, other than tradition, is there a literal connection with the birth of Christ to um, this time that we celebrate his birth? Ah, does uh, Christ's birth really fall on the 25th? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they're about. Uh, does Christ's birth... Uh, did it actually come around 1225? And that is a great one, because uh, if it didn't, how did we get that? <laughs> Can I add to your question, Barney? Okay. How did we get this date? And we better not take it. Good. No one's up, so no more. This is too many, as it is. Uh, does Christ's birth actually fall in 1225? Most likely not. Uh, because this is the start of the rainy season. If you know anything about Israel right now, there's, it's flooding over there. I, all my friends send me pictures. Um, I mean, there are three and four hundred foot waterfalls right now uh, coursing down the Judean hills and, and crashing into the Dead Sea area. And it's just, uh, just amazing what goes on. And so you would not have, if you valued your sheep, you would not have them out in the fields, the hills of, uh, uh, around Bethlehem, um, unless they were, you know, kept in their little pen, 
and uh, kept alive, but you wouldn't be roving around. So does Christ's birth come around 1225? Most likely not. But what's interesting is, and, and you can look this up. I mean, I'm not going to uh, uh, do a complete lesson on this, but what is fascinating is that Jesus Christ's birth most likely coincides with some of the uh, different feasts that, uh, uh, as you know, um, that Christ was uh, crucified at Passover and uh, he was buried uh, during the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and uh, rose at what, what they would uh, celebrate as a part of all this and then uh, ascended back to earth. Remember, he was here 40 days after his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And then, 10 days later, they celebrated uh, the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost. And um, so the church was born on a feast, and Christ was crucified and buried and risen in conjunction with a feast. And so the, and, and so if you go through the, the seven festivals of Israel, you can see that there seems to be some type of uh, correspondence with that, which would be that the, the next one, uh, trumpets, which is associated with Christ's return, and then the Rosh Hashanah, which, which is the trumpets, is also the new year, which follows after that the Day of Atonement, uh, which would probably coincide with the, the tribulation. Then they go right in from that, to the Feast of the Tabernacles, uh, which would possibly uh, correspond with the, the millennium. But how did we get to 1225? Basically this, and this is a thumbnail, uh, because I think this is my topic I would talk about all night, uh, because that's, that's what I did all of my uh, PhD work is in church history. But um, when the church was born and, and Christianity was legalized in 313 AD, there was a real problem. Uh, Constantine was a general, an emperor. Uh, he had conquered, as you know, um, his rivals at, and uh, was in his final battle. And what happened was he was just a Roman general, a pagan as pagans can be. And he was concerned about this battle, so he had this dream. And whether he had it or not, we don't know, but it's just part of history. And at the Milvian Bridge, if you look it up in, in history, Milvian Bridge, he was there with his legions and the other um, enemy forces were there. And in his dream, he saw a cross. And so he had all of his soldiers paint a cross, just a, just a cross on all their shields. And he, in the dream, his dream was in Latin, by the way, uh, and in hoc signe vince. You probably all have heard that famous saying. In this sign, conquer. In hoc signe vince. You probably say that to each other at home all the time. Uh, and this was the sign, the cross. And so Constantine, after winning this battle, in 313 issued an edict as the emperor of the Roman Empire that legalized Christianity. Up until that time, uh, Christianity was not, in fact, in the prior years to this, was the single greatest persecution of the church there'd ever been. Uh, three things happened, which affects even our, right down to the Bible you're holding today. Uh, the, uh, the prior emperor had, had decided that he would do three things. He would kill every known leader of the church, and he hunted them down like they'd never been hunted down before, over 10 years. Then he decided he would destroy every meeting place, and there is not a church standing anywhere in the world that predates him. He destroyed every one of them. By the way, he's the only Roman emperor that retired. 
he was so good at what he did, uh, his name was Diocletian, that he retired. I mean, he'd done everything. It's kind of like uh, the greatest emperor, and, and he did everything, and almost extinguished Christianity. This is the closest Christianity ever was to destruction. The last thing he did is he destroyed every copy of the Bible. And there is not one single complete copy of the Bible that predates him. He, he's, this is the closest Christianity got to extinguishing. And what they did is they broke the manuscripts up and because every complete, you know, all the books of the Bible, copies, he destroyed, uh, his legionnaires did, and every building and every leader. Well, now, that's for 10 years, so here's Diocletian, then we go to Constantine, we have a complete, it's kind of like going between administrations in Washington, we have a reversal. Now all of a sudden Constantine legalizes, he said another Latin word, religio licita, uh, that, that Christianity was, was a recognized religion. He had a problem though. There were millions of Christians. In fact, Christianity under this 10 year uh, persecution, Christianity grew more than at any other time even the first century. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the writers of the time wrote interesting things, and one of them said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, and the more people they killed, what started happening was that the legionnaires that were leading them out to execute them would take off their gear and get down with them and say, I too am a Christian. And so the emperor you ever heard, you know, better to join him than to, to uh, if you can't beat him, join him? Well, he couldn't beat him, so he decided to join him. And he legalized the millions of people that were Christians. But there's another problem in Rome. There was a state religion. Rome had, and you've all heard of this, and some of you probably have even visited it, the Pantheon, and pan means all, and theon means of the gods. And so Rome had this, the reason Rome conquered the world as it did is it didn't destroy any gods, it just added them. And so the Pantheon was just this big round building that has a little hole in the ceiling, if you've ever been there, where uh, the oculus, where the, the light comes through. And all the way around the edges of the building, every god of every, they just had niches for them. If you go into the Pantheon, even today, you can see the niches and every god that Rome conquered their people, they didn't destroy their god. They said, oh, we'll revere him too, or her, or it, or whatever it was, and they just moved him in. And they began to build up a massive priesthood. And so when Constantine legalized Christianity, he had millions of Christians, plus he had thousands of priests that were of the state religion. And Barney's waiting for the connection to Christmas, right? Because most people don't like history. Well, you have millions of Christians, but you have a highly organized priesthood of all these religions. And so what Constantine couldn't kill them all because there would be a, you know, just an empire-wide eruption from that of all these priests, of all these different gods. That's why he didn't say Christianity is the only. He legalized it and allowed Christianity to rise up. What I'm getting to is what we're still dealing with today. This is all of paganism. And paganism, all these gods of the pagans had all their customs and all of that was merged with the early church, which was legalized. And the early church, all of them were declared a part of the Roman Empire's religion. And so here's a primitive church that is reading the Bible and basically living in the catacombs. Uh, or wherever they could. I mean, during the prior persecution, those 10 years, they would actually lead people out to the edge, kind of like ISIS. The Romans, Roman legionnaires were like the current ISIS people. 
they would leave the town out to the edge of the cliff, and they'd say, are you a Christian? They'd, if they said yes, they'd push them over. And then they'd look at the next one, are you a Christian? And they'd push them over. Are you a Christian? Well, I mean, how far down the line do you have to go before you start wondering what you should say? But they just systematically killed the Christians, especially in the area of Turkey nowadays. And so this early church had suffered so much, and this is the first time they're coming out of their holes and out of their caves, and all of a sudden they're coming out and they are allowed equal footing with all the wealth of the pagan um, religions. And they're, they're given, you can have buildings and, and everything, and it all started running together. So that's, now let's think about this. The pagans worshipped the they, they worship the, the myths of the ancient world, which usually involved a mother goddess who was really very important. In fact, every religion, of, every pagan religion has some form of this. A mother goddess who had a son who died and then was resurrected. Did you know that? Did you know that, that, that that's part of Egyptian mythology? That's part of Canaanite mythology? That's part of Greek mythology? And what's interesting is that the mother goddess, the son, most often in the, the writings of the pagans, was killed by some horrible thing, mostly like a wild boar or some animal, killed this son of the mother goddess, and then after 40 days, he comes back to life. So this is just one example. So what do you do in the church with all that? Well, the mother goddess becomes, guess who? We talked about her this morning. Yeah. The son of the mother goddess that was killed becomes Christ. The 40 days, any of you former Catholics remember the 40 days of what? Oh, Lent. Do you see how what they did when they merged these two, the church began to pick up the paganism. The early church of Christ did not have candles, beads, incense. They did not have vestments, all these different colored outfits that were worn. They did not have the, um, you know, have you ever seen that? I don't even know the name of it. I'm not a good Catholic that the Pope wears. That was not in the church. All of the headdresses or whatever you want to call it, none of that, all of that, was just a part of pagan religion, including this calendar. Now, on December 25th, every year, was celebrated a, a global holiday. As you know, um, let's see, I always forget, I'm, I studied astronomy for a while, but one is called the solstice and the other is called the equinox, so whichever it is, the vernal equinox and the, so whatever it is, on December about 22nd is the darkest day on earth. It's the shortest day of the year where sunlight is least. And, and then on whatever it is, June something, 21st, I don't know what it is because I'm not a, a good uh, druid or anything, but anybody that's into this knows that the longest day uh, is something in June, and the shortest day is here. And in the pagans, you know that what they thought is something was eating at the sun, and finally the something, you know, was defeated, and the days started getting longer. And so they called this day the, the day when the, the, the shortest day ended and the longer days started, they called that the Sol Invictus. Now, all these Latin things, Sol, Sun, and, and this is when the sun 
finally overwhelms, not the S-O-N, the sun, the shining sun. And so what they started doing is they would celebrate after this day this victory of the sun. And it was huge. It became kind of like, in Rome at least, it was huge. It was a gigantic celebration because so much of sun worshiping, I mean, look at Heliopolis and all the stuff in Egypt. That, look at Stonehenge. There was such, such a close proximity of paganism to the sun that this was the biggest, probably, of all the holidays. So, the church, it was interesting. The church went through all kinds of uh, pendular swings about totally against paganism and then, you know, use paganism. And what happened is, by the time of um, Chrysostom, and Chrysostom was the pastor of one of the larger churches of the world, Constantinople, Constantine, you know, Constantinople, and uh, Chrysostom was quite a pastor. We have sermons nowadays. They, they called him the golden orator, the golden tongue. Uh, he was a very good preacher, and he preached a sermon saying, why not use the Sol Invictus as a celebration of the real victor, Christ? And they called their celebrations of Christ Mass. So why not make it a Christ Mass? And, and actually Cons or Chrysostom talked about why not, not compromising, use Christmas and bring life to it. And so, and, and uh, I mean, you can study this, almost everything uh, from holly to mistletoe to the Yule log, everything that you find out about Christmas has some kind of, you know, pagan something behind it that the church began to use as a connection point with the pagans. And so, uh, is there, when was Christ born? Christ, I mean, if you want to know, the Greek Orthodox have figured it out. They said that actually Christ was, was uh, John the Baptist was, was six months prior. If you notice, if you read this morning, the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said uh, that, that six months ago, uh, your cousin, Elizabeth conceived. And so John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus Christ. And it's very possible, according to the Greek Orthodox, that the conception of Christ was in December. The birth of John the Baptist uh, was in March. And that Christ was born probably sometime around the, the feast of, the, of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, somewhere in there. We don't know. It, it probably, Christ was probably, to get sheep out there, it had to be before September, October, to have sheep grazing um, out in the hillsides. Um, probably that would be the latest, because there isn't any grass in the hillsides. I mean, I was just there in October, and the sheep were desperate looking for anything to eat. So, how did we get, Barney, how did we get December 25th? We got it because of Chrysostom in the biggest church in the world saying, why don't we, since the whole, the whole world celebrates this holiday, why don't we take the high ground and, and go out and introduce Christ at this time? So, the, the, really, the bigger question is, is, Chris, is Christmas celebration pagan? Is a Christmas tree pagan? Why do we have Christmas trees? The pagans had trees. Why do we have trees? Well, Martin Luther went out and cut a tree and dragged it in Wittenberg, Lutherstadt, and celebrated Christmas because it says in Isaiah that the evergreen and the, the picture of endless life, and, and he even... Martin Luther even adds this, and he was a former Roman Catholic. So the, the, what you didn't ask me um, is whether I think it's wrong. Did you ask me that, Barney? I don't think the celebration of Christmas is wrong. What I do think is wrong is ever telling children that there's any Santa Claus. Uh, why, why do you think 
we should lie to our children in good fun and tell them there's Easter bunnies and Santa Clauses and all this stuff when there is not. When do they start believing us? And when, when does our stories blur into, you know, when we start telling about Christ, he goes, is that, is that one true? You know, you fooled me for my first six years with the man I had to be good for or he wouldn't give me stuff and it was actually you all the time when they get older and read the mail and see the charge cards, you know, and everything else. Uh, but do we really need to go into this? You know, I mean, this is only Christmas I talked about. Easter is far worse. Easter is Astarte, Ashtaroth, the goddess of fertility. Why do you think eggs and rabbits are the sign of Easter? That has nothing to do with Christ. Passover. But, and, and I'll just share one more thing. I mean, might as well as long. I always say, if you're going to offend them, offend them all at once, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, just hit everything at once. But uh, the Roman Catholic Church gradually uh, became anti-Semitic. Um, this is a lot more than you asked for, but it helps you understand. And so Jesus Christ, we know when he was crucified, buried, and risen. It's on our calendar every year. It's Passover. But the Roman Catholic Church did not want any attachment of the church to the Jews because they were cursed. They were Christ killers. In fact, Martin Luther wrote a pamphlet. Martin Luther, that we're all going to see in heaven, wrote a paper that was published. And it said, kill the Christ killers. It was an anti-Semitic writing by one of the reformers, which was read by a later German and used for the Holocaust. He says, hey, Luther, <laughs> patron saint of the Germans, wrote all this. Why? The Roman Catholic Church did not want the tie to Christ being uh, tied to Passover, so they disassociated Easter with Passover and, and, and tried to separate it with a different reckoning so that it would not be concurrent. And when they did that and removed all the Jewishness, what floats in? All the pagan stuff, the bunnies, the eggs, and everything else. So Christian holidays that we celebrate today, the only ones that are in the Bible uh, would be, I mean, Jesus, Jesus actually went to the temple during Hanukkah. Jesus did. It's a celebration of lights. Uh, Jesus celebrated the Passover. So did Paul. After, the, after he was saved, Paul celebrated the Passover. Now, he wasn't tied to the sacrifices, but he saw them pointing to Christ. So for me, personally, I, I think that Christmas is a family celebration where we as a church remember Christ, but it's not his actual birthday. Easter is a cultural event where we infuse Christ, but unless we're tying it to Passover, it's rare that Easter ever is concurrent with the true resurrection of Christ. It happens about every, I don't know, eight years that by somehow they didn't do it well enough and it lines right up and you see it. But most often, our celebration of Easter is not concurrent with when it really happened. And it's all because of back here what the Roman Catholic Church did. So what does that mean? Should we be like some people are who really don't help the cause and, and they are totally protesting Christmas and Easter? But they're Christians. And boy, does that confuse lost people. When Christ, you're, you're against Christmas, and you're a Christian. Mm, boy, that's interesting. You're against Easter, and you're a Christian. Boy, that's interesting. And when you start bringing up all this stuff on the pagan, unsafe people don't understand this. Because it says in, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. So what should we do? We should celebrate Christmas if you aren't, un, unless you have a conscience against it. And some people do. And some people... I mean, I've pastored 35 years, and there are people that are horrified that we have a Christmas tree. In fact, they get, they get ill when they see it in the church. You know what? We should be very cautious not to stick it to them, say, grow up, you know. They have a tender conscience, and, and some of them are trying desperately to live as pure and 
biblical a life as possible. And, and Christmas as we celebrate it isn't in the Bible, and neither is Easter as we celebrate it in the Bible. But what we should do is make the most of this time. I mean, they are playing our song right now. They're, they're starting. I mean, even in pagan places, they're playing our songs. Have you ever heard some of the doctrine in the Christmas carols? No more let sin and darkness reign. He comes. You know, to, and there's all of these incredible doctrinal songs. And, you know, sometime when they're playing one, you just say, wow, do you hear that? No. They don't even hear it. Say, well, listen to what it's saying. And they listen. And you say, do you know what that means? No. I thought it's just a Christmas carol. No, it's, it's most of the ancient Christmas carols have the gospel so prominent. So what I, what I say is, even though it's not 1225, Barty, uh, or even 24 or 26, it's a great time to declare Christ, to, to in a Christ-like way, it's more blessed to give than to receive, but most of all, to make this a time that we give to Christ. And, and that really, I remember when I was in seminary uh, at Dallas, that Howard Hendricks, used, one of the professors there, now with the Lord, used to take their entire budget that they would spend on Christmas, and their family would, would buy, they would adopt, kind of like we do, with Angel Tree and, and uh, the, the Christmas boxes. And the Hendricks family, their kids would buy the present that they wanted, and they would give that to the poorest of the poor in Dallas, where they lived. And I'll tell you what, that's something your kids would never forget. Not buy one for both. The Hendricks kids gave their present to the poorest person they could find in, in Dallas, Texas. And they all grew up, if you know anything about the Hendricks clan, they're not very materialistic. Because the parents said, this is not a season for you to tear open and, and say, I, I want something else, and tear open another one, and, and they're all no good by the end of the day. It's a season to sacrifice and to give. So, boy, uh, Barney, how did you get us that deep? Um, but thanks for asking that. Is that enough, or do you want me to say any more? That is enough. Thanks. Uh, uh, what does it mean to sing a new song? Let's go to Psalm 40 real quick, and we just have a few minutes. Uh, um, any of you that will stick with us. Um, it says in uh, Psalm 40, and uh, this is one of David's uh, life in the pits. And it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. He heard my cry. Uh, by the way, the new song is tied to a lot of things. One is one of the hardest of all the things for humans to do, waiting. Waiting for the Lord to incline to us. Waiting is hard, period. But he waited, and the Lord inclined to him, heard his cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock. He established my, my uh, steps. Now look at verse 3. And he put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. So what, what is the new song? The new song is remembering. Uh, and, and this, I mean, David uh, wasn't in a literal miry, muddy pit. David, and this starts back in Psalm 13, any of you that uh, are David studiers, and it says in Psalm 13, you've forgotten me. How long will you hide your face from me? How long will you take my, will, will I take counsel in my soul? Basically, David was in a horrible depression. He felt abandoned by God. And in Psalm 40, he felt like he was trapped in a pit. And when the Lord came and rescued him and brought him out and put uh, his feet on the rock and, and helped him not to fall back into that pit, that's when he said he put a new song in my mouth, and here's the new song. Uh, I think it was Liz. Was that Liz or? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't see how those kids can sing with these lights on. It's very hard to see you all. Uh, you know, you have to go like this. But, but the new song is praise to our God that many will see and will trust in the Lord. Uh, in fact, if you look over at Psalm 96 for just a second, and I'm not sure how we'll get I'll, I never finish all these things. 
But look at Psalm 96. See, this is a theme that goes all the way through. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, Psalm 96, 1. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news. So what does the, the new song mean? It's a song that's, the, the new song is focused on the Lord. And, and Psalm 98, by the way, says the same thing. It's, it's a song that's focused on the Lord that we waited for, and he came and delivered us. And that's why by the time we get to Revelation, I could take you through all the songs of Revelation. All of the songs are focused on that same new song of praise. It, it, most people sing and whistle and go through life when things are going good. The new song is that you sing from the pits because of gratitude for the one that is rescuing us out of it. And the new song is based on redemption, not on circumstances, not on prosperity or health or anything else. And so what it means to sing the new song is to reflect on the Lord. It's always God-focused. It's always redemption-driven. And so it has to do with uh, the deliverance from sin. And if you look at that, that is the content of the songs we're all going to sing in Revelation. So oh, we have three minutes. Okay, here we go. Hebrews 11. Dale Van Dyke. Let's, is there one before that that I missed? Oh, no, B-C-A-D. Well, by the way, I, I started talking about this. Uh, then I'll go to Dale. I don't want to miss number one. How did the Old uh, Testament people count? It's called regnal counting. They, they counted from the, the times of the kings all the way through. From the times of the Babylonian kings, they had their own system. In fact, the way they counted in the Old Testament, in, in the time before Christ, they all counted their own ways. Uh, the, the Egyptians were counting the dynasties, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, they were counting. The Chinese had their own system so that everyone had a different calendar. The Jews had their calendar. Did you know what they're on? You're, what, 57-something? Anybody Jewish or read the papers? They're on everybody. Uh, had their own counting system. So it, it was uh, confusion on the counting. And it was all based on where you lived. And so what archaeologists do is they go in Babylon and look at their records and find any congruence to the, you know, what's going on in Assyria. And then they try and tie what's going on in Egypt. And once they find, it's almost like a, a bingo or tic-tac-toe. Once they find an event in all three, then they can localize a date to that. And that's all archaeologists are doing, are, are finding from all these myriads of calendars. And once you do that, it'll say in the third year of Nabo, uh, you know, Palazar, and this will say that it was in the 27th year after whoever, and they find a date. So that's the confusion. So what happened? The Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church took the former Julian calendar. Do you remember Julius Caesar? He saw the problem. He saw all these, and so the Roman Empire had to make a calendar. So the Julian calendar was established until the Gregorian calendar uh, had to come across through the Pope Gregory, who was one of the, the most powerful of all the popes, and uh, Gregory the Great. And when the Gregorian calendar came in, they actually had to declare the date. They said, tomorrow morning when you wake up, it's going to be August 1st. In some parts of the world, it was May. In some parts of the world, it was June. In some parts of the world, it was February. But all of a sudden, Pope Gregory said, boop, this is the date. Now, there are holdouts. There's still somebody over in Indochina that still has the old date, and they're like four months away from us. Uh, I forget which one of the kingdoms over there. But basically, then they started tuning it up, and we got... And by the way, there's still two ways of calculating the date, the solar and the lunar. And that is fascinating, uh, because the lunar year is 360 days, and you all know that our solar year is 365 and a quarter. And so there's always a discrepancy, and that's why we have leap years and all the other stuff that goes on. But how, back to the question, so, so what started this B.C. A.D.? That, that is because of Pope Gregory. And so before Christ, 
And actually, A.D. doesn't mean after death. It's another Latin word, anno domini, in the year of our Lord. And uh, the real question is, what year was Christ born in? And most likely, he was born in s between 4 and 6 B.C. Because when they reset the calendar, what they didn't do is is fix the discrepancies between the lunar and the solar and, and all that. And so how are they counting? In confusing ways. One of the most, for any of you that are interested in this, uh, The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings is a tremendous book, uh, Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings. And what it is is it's a, a study by a guy named Tila uh, who, who found that you really do have a consistent chronology in the Old Testament, and, and, uh, but boy, that is heavy-duty stuff, and it's fun to study. And so, Dale, we don't have time for you, uh, <laughs> but basically, when, now remember, you, you have to understand that God said, from the rising to the setting of the sun, do you think anybody in the universe knows better than God that the sun does not rise and set? Those, those terms are to relate to us. In fact, God uses many of them. They're called anthropomorphisms. When, when we're talking about God saying his arms underneath his everlasting arms, and he'll put his pinions over you. God does not have feathers. He doesn't have wings. Under his wings thou shalt trust. What is going on here? He's relating to us. And so when, when he told, and, and look at what Dale's saying. I mean, you should, I'll read it to you. It's Hebrews 11, but look what it says. And the Lord said, uh, look now toward heaven, uh, therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky multitude innumerable. And what is quoting is Genesis, when God said, look now toward heaven and look at the stars. Okay, when, when Abraham looked at the stars, there were only 7,000 and some, 8,000 total could be counted. He was 100 he could not have children. His wife was 90. She could not have children. And God says, you're going to have more than 8,000 children. That, he didn't think billions, nor did he think millions. And what the Lord said is the second part. So what he said is, you're going to have the biggest number that you can see. Think about it in the ancient world. What could you see? They had that many things other than the stars. I mean, when you're laying out with your sheep, it just seems like they multiply. There's just more you look, the more you see. So this is numberless, and so is this. The sands, I mean, try counting the sands. What he's, what he's talking about is two human looking things that are numberless. Even 40 billion, without the aid of machinery, how high can we count? Try and keep track of counting up to even a million. Without a computer, without anything. Just trying to write down and add up and calculate and count. To, to Abraham, 8,000 was hard to count to. The sands of the sea, he's saying, humanly impossible to count. Now we say, in fact, I don't say Dale, uh, it was Henry Morris, the founder of the Institute of Creation Research, that said probably 40 billion people plus uh, have, have lived, and now the Institute for Population Control actually thinks it's a few more than that. I think they're at 50 billion humans. But whatever they are, God said, I'm going to bless you with both a physical descendant, and through you, you're going to bless everybody else through Christ. And so, but Dale, it, it is figurative, and uh, there aren't octillions of people, and I don't remember what the rest of them were, but let me see what we missed because I won't be able to sleep tonight worrying about it. <laughs> Was there another question? Oh, so I got through them all? Praise the Lord. Well, I'm not going to go any further. Let's all stand. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, oh, there, look at that. Uh, happy to, to uh, that. Do you see why people fell out of the windows when Paul was teaching? <laughs> and he didn't have a smart board, okay, uh, to keep him occupied. But let's bow together. Father, we thank you for seeing the joy in these precious children's faces. Thank you for each one who stood up there and quoted uh, their lines and their verses and the eagerness which they came down from the choir to their spot and when they sang or spoke, just the joy it was 
But thank you most of all that we did all of those things and that Katie and Corey did all of the countless hours that they spend with those kids because we want to give to you this Christmas season. And even though you probably weren't even born anywhere near the 25th, we've picked that day to remember as a body and as a church and as a world that you are the one that came and we worship you tonight and pray that we would live in a way that pleases and glorifies you. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you as you go.